I want to give God, you know, you guys know I like to give a, a glory report, right? Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to register trademark that <laughs> glory report. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, you guys can actually turn, turn your heads around and look back at that table back there behind the Christmas trees. Um, that is a bunch of how many? Do you know how many for sure? No. Um, so we have, a, we have our Christmas event coming up this week coming up, um, Saturday, um, which we were, we got, we had 11 or 12 families, 13, 13 families, almost 40 kids that we adopted as a church and we are going to help provide Christmas for. Um, and so we've been, we did a yard sale a couple weeks ago, last weekend, last weekend um, to raise some money. We raised $600. That's how much Robin thought it was going to take to, for the church to buy enough gifts to provide for all these people. And then, but God, Amen. but God, because Robin works at the North Little Rock Police Department and they do their own thing um, called Shop with Cop. Shop with Cop. And so um, God worked it out. I, I should have her come up here and tell the story, but God worked it out and we got donated all of those toys back there by the North Little Rock Police Department. Um, on top of the $600 that we raised, on top of you guys and your generosity and the, the families that you guys took, that you prayed over and that you're providing for, um, I just can't even, like, God is so good. Amen. And he, when you're generous, doesn't he bless? Amen. Isn't he more generous? Amen. So as, as generous as you think you are, multiply that times infinity, and that is God's <laughs> generosity. Amen. And I just I wanted to give him glory for that because that is so awesome when I look back there and see that table full of toys. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I, Robin brought those here on Friday, um, and she had to have me come help unload her car and everything. And I was, I was having a rough day on Friday um, just because of some things, some... You know, it's one of those days where I'm trying to prepare and trying to do, trying to, you know, be spiritual work. And, and work and prepare a message and prepare for today. And it's one of those days that Satan just kept throwing every distraction um, that he could. You guys ever have those days before Amen. where you're trying to do something? And usually it's when you're trying to do something great for God. And Satan just has a way of throwing distractions. Usually they come in the form of your kids. Right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and one, you know, and I'm not going to go there, but the point is that I was having a rough day. Satan was trying to throw distraction after distraction. Um, and I came up here to help Robin unload her car. And the, the rough day and the distractions and the everything that was going on just kind of went away because I was like, wow, God, like, he is so good. And even in our darkest, roughest days, He's still on the throne, and he is still good, and he's still a hundred million times more generous than we ever deserve. Um, and that's that's an example of it back there, amen. So I want you guys give God some glory. Yeah, like go ahead and give him some. Clap your hands in church because he is worthy of it, right? Amen. He is worthy of even way more than what we just gave him right there. While you guys. Um, Go ahead and open your Bibles to uh, the book of First Peter. We're going to stay in First Peter. Um, I told you that this series was based out of First Peter. Um, and we're going to be in a couple other places, but you don't have to turn there because I've actually taken the taken the time to put them up on the screen for you. I know, right? I'm actually let's Working. let's get let's get technical in here. Um, Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11 is where we're going to be. The series today is called, the series, of course, that we're, go back, Garrett, is, of course, re-gifted. So I want you to look around to your neighbor, okay? Don't touch your neighbor, I mean, unless you're family. Um, look around to your neighbor, and I want you to tell them you are gifted. You can do that out there online, too. I want you to put that out on the chat or on the comments or whatever. Put, I am gifted, because you are gifted. If you're a believer, if you're born again, you are gifted. Now look at your neighbor and say, now give it back. <laughs> because that's what we're called to do, okay? That is what we're called to do. Um, today, like I said earlier in my, intro, my welcome or whatever, if you like to talk, 
this message is for you. But even if you don't like to talk, this message is still for you. And I'll tell you why here in just a minute. So the gift of gab is what this, the title of today's message is called. How many of you guys have heard that saying before? Raise your hand if you've heard the saying gift of gab. Raise your hand if you've been told you have the gift of gab. <laughs> How did I know? I wasn't going to call you out, Mike. I wasn't going to say if you like to hear the sound of your own voice again like you, yeah. like we did before. I don't know what it is, but God, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but over the last month or so, God has laid on me and, and directed three separate messages about speaking. Mm -hmm. Have you guys noticed that? Mm -hmm. Today's message is about speaking. It's about the gifts of speaking, the speaking gifts of the Holy Spirit, okay? We had a message a couple weeks ago about devote your voice, about speaking. There was a message in James about watching your words and using your words wisely. I don't know why God has directed it this way. Maybe, maybe it's me. Maybe I need to be using my words more wisely and really devoting my voice and devoting my, devoting my words to him. Maybe it's somebody in here. Maybe it's you. I don't know. But the gift of gab. The reason I titled this The Gift of Gab is because the gift of gab actually means, I looked it up, and it actually means, I don't even know if it's in the dictionary, but what, the, what, the, what Google says, what the WWW says, it says the ability to speak with eloquence and fluency. Eloquence and fluency. And I know a couple of you raised your hands about the gift of gab, that you have been told you have the gift of gab, but I don't know, I don't know sometimes about eloquence and fluency. I don't, I don't know about that. Um, but I know several of us in here, some of you in here, and a couple of you raise your hands, but I know some, a couple of others that didn't raise their hands, I would say you have the gift of gab. I would. I, do, I don't personally, I wouldn't say I personally had the gift of gab, um, which is why I said that if you like to talk, this message is for you, but also if you don't like to talk, this message may still be for you because God can still gift you with something to speak for him even if you don't like to talk. I know most pre a lot of preachers, actually, a lot of pastors and a lot of preachers are actually quiet, meek kind of people when you meet them outside of the, off the stage or out from behind the pulpit. But then when they get up on the stage, there's something about the Holy Spirit that fills them that you wouldn't guess that they're the way they are off the stage. And I feel like I'm kind of that way because I don't really, like, I'm more of an introvert than I am an extrovert, I would say. Um, but there's something about when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you that you just can't, you just can't keep it in, right? Um, my definition, so this is the definition I made up of the gift of gab, okay? And you can write this down if you want to use it. I think it's the supernatural ability to talk a lot about a lot of things to a lot of people. You guys catch that? The supernatural, because it's not... It's not natural. I don't think it's natural for people to just talk about anything and everything to anybody and everybody about, you know, but there's something supernatural about the way God works in your DNA that gives you the ability to talk to anybody about anything at any time for a long period of time, right? Raise your hand if you know somebody. You may be sitting next to them. I don't know. <laughs> and if you didn't raise your hand, it may be you. Um, now, who fits that definition? Raise your hand if you, if you, the ability to talk about a lot of things to a lot of people at a lot of times. Okay. God wants to use someone's gift of gab for his good news and for his glory. So, if you're a talker, if you're a leader, if you're a salesperson, because most salespeople like to talk, right? Amen, Mike? Okay. If you're a salesperson, if you're a teacher, if you've ever taught before in your life, or if people seem to flock to you for some reason, if you have a natural charisma, natural just something that people, your, people are drawn to you, okay? All of these things, I believe God wants to use you. Now, all of these people that I just mentioned, all of those those, all of those people, those types of people, not all those people will find that they've been gifted by the Spirit to speak on his behalf. And some people that don't fit any of those categories will find that they are gifted by the Holy Spirit to speak on his behalf. 
So it doesn't really matter, but I'm just saying, if you are one of those people, then you, among everybody else, should really seek him and really seek the Holy Spirit and his guiding of if you are gifted in one of these areas. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So I'm about to dive in. I'm about to dive into what these speaking gifts are. And I know that there's some probably some people out there watching online or some of you in here maybe thinking, oh, Lord, he's about to, he's about to talk about speaking in tongues up in this Baptist church. <laughs> No, I'm not, actually. Uh, I'm avoiding that one completely because that one is still, that one actually is still up for debate, um, in my opinion. So I'm not even going to preach on that because I'm not going to preach on that until I'm sure um, of what God, how God, I'm not, I, the thing is that God is a holy, powerful, mighty God, and I believe he can do anything he wants to do. And if that is gifting somebody to speak in a language that they don't even, that they've never learned before, I believe God can still do it today if he wants to. That's just my opinion on it. We're not going to get into that, though. But there are some speaking gifts. There are some speaking positions and some speaking uh, titles that we're going to get into today. Some that still exist, some that don't still exist. But the gifts still exist, and they still continue. Okay? Um, the thing that I want you guys to know, though, the thing that God wants you to know through this message is the greatest gift that we can give is the good news to the lost Amen. and glory to the Lord. Amen. We all have the ability to do that. Right. Give the good news to the lost and give glory to the Lord. That's the greatest gift that we can give, and we all have the ability to do that. Okay, So let's dive in. 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 10. I'm going to read just 10 and 11 again. But we're going to dive in, and I'm going to show you some other scriptures that kind of go along with this message um, that God directed me to. So just buckle your seat belts. I was going to say pew belts, but we don't have pews. Buckle your seat belts, your holy seat belts, and let's take a ride on. There's a pastor we used to have that said, take a ride on Air Jesus, and I, I like that. I haven't heard that in a while. If you're there, say amen. Amen. All right, it says, based on the gift each one has received, use it to serve others as good managers of the very grace of God. And then this is where we're going to be spending the majority of the time. If anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the fact that you still gift people today and that you give these gifts for us to turn around and give back to others and to give glory to you through it all. Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit take these words of mine and use them for your good. And mo more than that, I pray for that your Holy Spirit soften our hearts right now to receive the word that you have for us so that we can take it and use it in our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. 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 So the first, there's a couple things. There's um, a couple points about this gift of gab that I'm going to bring out, okay? The first point is, and we see this in, in Peter, in First Peter right here. The first point is, there is a goal to the gift. There is a goal to every gift that the Holy Spirit provides for, his, for God's children, okay? And we see that in, we, we kind of hit on that last week, the message last week. If you tuned into the message last week or if you were here for the message last week, it was called Gifted and Talented. And basically the goal is if you're gifted and if you're a born-again believer, you are gifted because he has gifted each one of us. If you're gifted, then your gift is supposed to be served. That's the whole point of the series. We receive gifts just like you receive a Christmas gift and you turn around and you, you don't like it, so you re-gift it. <laughs> Except this is a gift that you should like, but you should turn around and re-gift it to someone else and speak into someone else, okay? The goal of speaking is to serve others. And you can find that in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, but I'm going to read 11 through 13 right now. And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into a mature man 
with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So we're going to hit on a few. These This lists out some of the, the, the positions or titles that I was mentioning earlier, okay? But we see some of the goals in here of what these speaking gifts are for, what these the reason why God gives us to be able to speak on his behalf, okay? The first one is for building the body. That's what it says there. It says, for the training of the saints in the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. Now, the first, I'm going to teach just a little bit here, so you guys just hold on. Um, the first couple that, I'm going to, that he names here, there's a difference between these as offices or positions as opposed to the gifts that come along with them, Okay. So the first two that he mentions, some to be apostles and some to be prophets, okay? An apostle is actually someone, the, the meaning of the word apostle is one sent forth by another with a special commission. Somebody sent forth by God with a special mission, a special commission, okay? These were foundation, earlier in the book of Ephesians, Paul writes that these were foundational people, okay? The apostles that Paul writes about were the 12 disciples, and then Matthias, which is the, the next disciple that took Judas's place, okay? So there's 13 true apostles. And the reason why is because the officer position apostle, apostle is not here today is because these only can be held by someone who witnessed the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus. Right. And you find that in Acts chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, if you want to go back and fact check me. Um, that's, that was Paul list or the writer of Acts, who is Luke lists out the qualifications of an actual apostle. Okay. So we don't have apostles today. Right. If you hear anybody call themselves an apostle, you need to rebuke them in the name of Jesus, <laughs> or you need to turn around and go the other direction because there are no such thing as an apostle. I don't know any single person that has witnessed physically the resurrected form of Jesus in this life. Right. We, re we all witness him in our lives through the Holy Spirit. But the physical seeing of Jesus in resurrected form, nobody, not a single person can say they know that. But the gift that comes along with the apostle still exists today. And that gift is one sent forth by another, by another with a special commission. The gift of people being sent forth is now seen today in what we call modern day missionaries. So people that are able to go into a foreign land, into a different culture, into some place that they don't know, to see people that to speak to people that they don't know, those are gifted with that gift. They're not apostles, but they have the same gift as the apostles do. And this is for building the universal church of God, right? Because that's why we have that's why we have missionaries is to get the word of God out there to foreign countries that don't know about Jesus, right. and these people that are gifted in this area and there's we've had some that have come to this church and spoke before. I've met some missionaries and they they truly have a gift because I don't know I don't know if I have that gift because I don't know if I could go to Uganda or Belize or uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia or someplace like that and be able to live there and and be able to preach the gospel in these countries that I have no idea about or culture about because like I said I'm not I'm a I'm an introvert and so you have to truly be an extrovert to be able to go to these places and do that there's that gift still exists today okay the second one is prophets this means speaking or foretelling the truth of God. Now, when we think of the, the word prophet, you think of predicting the future, right? That's a, automatically, amen? Is that where you guys, automatically where your guys, your minds go when you hear the word prophet? Huh? Most of the time. Most of the time. Um, but it actually means bringing the word of God. Is what the, That's what prophets did back in the day. The Old Testament prophets and even some New Testament prophets, they received a revelation, a fresh new word from God, directly from God. And they spoke that to people. Okay? The officer position of prophet received and revealed fresh revelation and truth straight from God, which now we receive from the completed word of God and the Holy Spirit. So there's no reason why we get a, there's if you if you know anybody that calls themselves a prophet or that says that they got a, a vision from a word from God that 
goes against what the Bible says, then that is a false teacher. That is a false prophet. You need to run away from them. You need to rebuke them. Because everything that God wants us to know is right here in his word. That's why it is the completed 100% word of God. Okay? And the Holy Spirit can give fresh revelation, fresh application from this. And those people are what ha who have the gift that still exists today from this prophet. Okay? They're not actually telling the future, which there's a lot of people that have told the future of 2020, or they say they've told the future of 2020. There's a lot of people that have said they had dreams about people wearing masks. I don't know if you guys have seen these people. No, you can search it on YouTube. There's people that have come out and said that they had dreams. But you know what is funny about all these people? They came out and said all this after the pandemic and after people were walking around in masks. And so I think there's something a little bit funny to that. Um, and some people have actually said the end of this year, these same people that had these dreams, that had these visions from God, ha have said other things that haven't really happened at the end of this year, like mass chaos and stuff like that. So the, the point about all of this is there's, not, there's no prophets today. There's no people that receive from God something that, uh, that we can't receive from God through his holy word that tell the future, okay? Prophet today, the gift of prophecy today is the gift of telling God's word. And we find that today in people that study God's word. And most of the time we find that in pastors and preachers, uh, evangelists, people that s study the word of God, that pray, that s pray in the spirit, that study in the spirit, and then receive a word from God to give to people to apply to their lives. That's what prophecy today is, okay? Amen? What this, this actually means, given instruction, because that's what prophets did in the Old Testament. They gave instruction. They gave warnings from God. They gave exhortation from God, which that just basically means encouragement. Exhortation, that means encouraging somebody to do right, encouraging them in the way that they're going. Um, and then there was also rebuking. There was a lot of rebuking from the Old Testament prophets. Preachers do that. I hope preachers do that today. I hope preachers are giving instruction and warning and exhorting and encouraging and rebuking because that's what the word of God does. And we should be able to read this word of God in the spirit with the spirit guiding and directing and get a revelation from God through his word. That's the gift. And the people that can turn around and speak that, that's the gifting of, that is the same as the gifting of prophecy. But we just don't have people that like can tell the future. It, people say they can tell the future, but until, until God reveals it to me through his word, I'm not going to believe it. Amen? Amen? And then the second thing that we see, now those, so those offices, those positions don't actually exist today because those were foundational. Those were for the building of the church, the starting of the church. That's what Paul says earlier in Ephesians, okay, is that those were foundational positions, the gifting still continues. Now, these positions that I'm about to read still do exist, okay? And these are for the training of the saints. That's the second goal that Paul writes about here. These still exist both in gifting and in title. The first one is evangelists. Evangelists announce the good news of salvation to the lost and tell them how to receive salvation. <clears throat> Again, most preachers, I, I pray that preachers and pastors are doing this because that is the whole point of pastor of preaching is sharing the good news. Like I said in that quote, the greatest gift that we can give is the good news to the lost and glory to God, right? Evangelists still exist today. There are people today that are still gifted in, I, we knew one from uh, way back in the day. Actually, Robin got, Robin got saved in a service where I think one of the greatest evangelists that I've ever heard preach uh, was preaching. His name was Tom Whitsett. Um, and he, that dude could he could evangelize like he there was just something about when he spoke that God used him to share the good news and people got saved. Billy Graham, probably the greatest example of an evangelist. OK, there are people still today that have the gift of, of evangelizing and they are there. They're people that travel the country. They may not even travel the country. Maybe they, they just do it in their own church. But the gift still exists today. And we all can do a little bit more to share the good news of, of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. The, the second one is pastors. 
Pastors basically means shepherding a flock. The word pastor literally means shepherd. Okay? Um, it's a diligent effort to help people mature in the Christian life. And it includes guiding, it includes feeding, and it includes guarding. Now, when you think of a shepherd, that's what they do with their sheep. They guide them, they feed them, and they protect them. They guard them from the wolves. And you think of David when he said that he, he actually fought off bears and wolves to protect his flock, right? That's what the goal, that's what the, the position of pastor is supposed to do, feed the flock. That's what Jesus told Peter to do, feed my sheep, right? That still exists today. Obviously, we have a pastor. Um, you've, been, you've sat under pastors. You know pastors. That position still exists today. It's a calling that can only come from God because I don't know anybody that would truly want to be responsible for a bunch of sheep. <laughs> Because we know what we know what sheep are, right? Sheep are not smart animals, right? I'm not calling you guys dumb. I really am not. But the Bible calls us sheep, amen. That's right. So it's a it's a call position, and pastors still exist today. And a lot of these they they kind of intermingle with each other, right? Pastors should be prophesying the word of God. They should be evangelizing the good news of Jesus, and they should be doing this last thing too: teachers. The ability to explain and clearly apply effectively the truths of word, the, the word of God. It includes understanding and giving words of knowledge and giving words of wisdom. Those are all, so the exhortation, the, the feeding and the, the, gui the uh, guiding and the protecting, the giving words of knowledge and giving words of wisdom, those are all also listed in the Bible as gifts of the Holy Spirit, these speaking gifts that I'm talking about, okay? Teachers. Now, God calls some teachers, but not to be pastors. But all pastors should be able to teach the word of God. Amen. All of us have a little bit of a responsibility in all of these gifts, if you think about it. God may not call you to these positions, but all of us share a little bit of responsibility in these gifts. Right? All of us share a little bit of responsibility. If you think about it, every believer shares some responsibility. Not every one of you will be gifted by the Holy Spirit to use these for the local church, but every one of you will use these. If you, for the universal church, for one, you know there's a little C church, which is the local body church, like our church right here, the body of believers from the local. And then there's a universal church, the big C church, which is all of God's children, right? We are all gifted to use those at some, in some form, fashion, or another for the universal church to bring people into the body of Christ, right? I mean, that's why the Great Commission says, go therefore, make disciples, baptizing the people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why in Acts it says, uh, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, out the ends of the earth, right? Because we all play a part. And we can all use a little bit of those gifts. But it's up to us to seek God's Holy Spirit to see if we're gifted to use those for the local body as a position, right? Amen. Amen. If, you have a ch if you have children or a family, then we have a responsibility to do these things, to evangelize to them, share the good news of Jesus with them, to teach them what the Word of God says, to prophesy what the Word of God says, and how to apply it to their life, to exhort them and encourage them to live their lives better. If they're doing good things, if they're doing right for God, encourage them in what they're doing. If they're not doing right, rebuke them and correct them. That's what 1 Timothy says, the, the word of God is, a, is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword for rebuking, for teaching, all of these things. We should be doing that with our own family, right? That's right. So if you have friends and people that look up to you, I think I've pretty much hit on everybody here because we all have family. We all have children. We all have friends or people that look up to us. Then we all share a little bit of a part in these gifts, right? Mm -hmm. It's up to you to seek if God is calling you to use that gift for him in the local body of the church. And when you do that, there's a couple things that I want to make sure you understand with this gift. Okay. The second point. There's a greatness to the gift. There's a greatness to the gift of Gad. 
And a greatness basically meaning there is power in the gifting of speaking for God, right? We find that in 1 Peter um, chapter 10 and 11. He says, if anyone speaks, it should be as one who speaks God's words. Amen. If anyone speaks, if anyone is gifted with one of these, the gift of gab, it should be as one who speaks God's words, the very words of God. That's exactly what Paul meant um, when he when he wrote, he continued writing in Ephesians, he says, Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by the wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way to, into him who is the head, Christ. That's what Paul meant by speaking the truth in love. The very words of God mean speaking the truth in love to everybody you come in contact with. To speak the very words of God literally means... The oracles of God is what that word means. God's words, where, it said, where Peter says, um, the one that speaks, should sp who speaks God's words. It means divine utterances from God. What God would lay on your heart to speak to someone. It's the same word that they used in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, when uh, Luke was writing and, and Peter was preaching. And he, he was talking about describing the words Moses spoke over the Israelites in the wilderness. The very divine utterance, the very voice, the very words of God that get laid on your heart to speak to someone. That's what he's talking about right here. There's great power in speaking the very words of God into and over someone. God's, words have, God's word has power. Amen? Amen? Do you guys believe that? Yeah. That the ultimate power of anything is found in his word and through the Holy Spirit. And there is great power in speaking the very words of God into and over someone. And the power, the thing that we got to realize is, this is the greatness that I'm talking about here, the greatness in this gift that he gives people, is the greatness is pointing to him. The greatness is the power that comes from him. The power is in his word and not in our work. The power is in his word. And when he lays a word on you that you find in his holy word, that the Holy Spirit says, and he urges you, you need to speak this to someone, you need to speak this over someone, then you might have the gifting of the speaking gifts that I'm talking about. Amen? Amen? While the context here is clearly about preaching and teaching God's word, there's a practical application for all of us. Again, it's something we're all called to do. We need to live and stand according to the very words of God. Amen. Our lives should live and stand according to the very words of God, right? When it says speak, those who speak, speak the words of God, our lives should show the words of God. We need to proclaim his truth, his word, without apology. If we have to apologize for something that's in his word, when it offends somebody, then there's a problem with that. We should be able to speak his word we should be able to live his word without apologizing. And then after all, you might be the only glimpse of God that somebody gets, right? Your life may be the only glimpse of God, may be the only Bible that somebody actually sees. And so we have to be very faithful to what his word says and walk in this manner, walk worthy of the calling. And we all have a calling because we are all called his children. And it says, walk, walk, walk worthy of his calling. But the thing is, with great power comes great responsibility. I, I'm quoting Superman or Spider-Man here. Uncle ben. Huh? Uncle Ben? Uncle ben. He says it's yeah, he says that's, yeah, that's right. I thought you meant Uncle Ben's rice. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> no. Sp <laughs> Sp this is from Spider-Man, okay? Uncle Ben, apparently, is the one that told Peter Parker this. With great power comes great responsibility. And we have to realize that when it comes to the word of God, when, we, when it comes to these, this gift, the gifting of speaking that God gives people, okay? There is great power in God's word. God's word can bring somebody from death to life. It can bring somebody from darkness into light. I mean, he says we are the light of the world and the light should not be put on a hilltop, shouldn't be covered with a, a, a cover. It should be shown for all the world to see, right? Our, God's word has great power, but there's a great responsibility for us. And that means that 
the believer, us, when I say the believer, I pray that you're all believers. Uh, only you can, only you know that. Only you and God know that. But the believer can only speak the very words of God if they stand on its source first. Mm -hmm. And the source of the word of God is this right here. You have to stand on this. Mm -hmm. There's a great responsibility in that because that means in order to speak God's word, you have to speak to God. Mm -hmm. In order to speak God's word, you have to be in God's word. That's right. If you try to speak God's word without being in God's word, then you're speaking on your own ability and your own, they end up being your own words. Mm -hmm. So you have to stand on the source first. The believer can only speak the very words of God if they speak to the source first. You have to be in prayer with God. There is great power in God, in the word of God and speaking the word of God over people and into people's lives. But make sure you're checking with the source first. Make sure you're praying in the spirit and God is laying it on your heart that you need to speak this word into somebody's life. Because if you don't do that first, you're speaking your words into their life. Right. So there's a great responsibility. The believer can only speak the very words of God if they find the strength in the source too. It takes boldness to be able to speak on behalf of God, the very words of God, over somebody. But when you're standing on the strength of the source, that boldness comes from the Holy Spirit. And you can speak with a boldness. You can speak with a passion. You can speak with purpose. They only can come from God. Amen. If you're not standing on the strength of the source, then you're standing on your own strength. And Satan is going to take advantage of that. And you're going to end up speaking something to someone that God didn't intend you to speak to someone. Amen? Right. Again, the world doesn't need a message that makes them feel good about the life they're living. We have a lot of preachers that are preaching messages that make people feel good about the life they're living. Or good, they make them feel good about the person they are, or feel good about uh, what's in them, right? Instead, no. The world needs a message about what God can do through you if you empty yourself and let him fill you. And that you can only find through his word, through the source of his word, which is God himself and the strength of standing on his word. And when you do that, man, there's power in that. Again, all believers should be walking examples of this kind of life. We should be. We should be able to show others around you what happens when God, when you empty yourself and let God fill you. Your life should be a walking example of that. Those that have been graced with the gift of gab should boldly proclaim this message and this good news. But it's only it's up to you to seek the Holy Spirit and to get with God and to see if God has gifted you in this way that he wants you to use in the local church. When you do that, you have to realize that there's a gravity. There's a gravity to the gift. I was pretty, I was pretty, um, I was trying to seek what word God would have me use for this point right here. And the word gravity just came, keep coming to me, kept coming to me. Um, and I think it's a cool, it's a cool word because when you think of gravity, what does it do? It keeps you grounded. There's a weight from the moon that is put on us here on earth that keeps you grounded, that keeps you on the ground. There's a, a quote that I've heard that says, um, what is it, reach for the stars, but keep your feet on the ground, or keep your head in the stars and your feet on the ground, or something like that. Um, I don't know where that quote came from or what it has to do with this message, but um, we have to realize, though, if you've been gifted with the gift of gab, if you've been gifted with one of these speaking gifts, if God is calling you to use your voice and to speak his message, boldly by standing on his strength and standing on his source then there's a gravity that comes along with that because a lot of times people can get their head can get too big for God to use we find this in where Paul writes in first Thessalonians I love this verse when I started studying this verse I was like oh my gosh God more people need to hear this okay first that's what that <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. 
And I, you guys have to realize that Paul, a lot of people, when Paul spoke, they thought he was a little, you know, I think Paul was a little dude. I think Paul was short. Um, I don't know why. I just think that. Um, that's not in the Bible anywhere. But um, I also think Paul walked with a limp. Um, it says in the Bible that he had, I mean, you got to think, the dude was beat and shipwrecked and in jail, and he went through a con all kinds of stuff. So I think he was a little dude. I think he had a, a little bit of a limp, maybe a, maybe a pimp walk limp. I don't know. <laughs> not really. But um, when Paul spoke, a lot of people thought he was prideful and arrogant. And so I think Paul really had to write this to himself, for one. I think God laid this on him to write this. I think when, it talk, when Paul talks about the thorn that God put in his side, I think it was to keep his pride in check. Yeah. There's a thorn that God puts in all people that are gifted with the gift of speaking. Because this platform is, I mean, this platform right here is not very big compared to some of the platforms that, you know, some of these preachers that, like, Joel Osteen, uh, Stephen Furtick, some of these preachers that have huge platforms that are very visible. Um, I think God puts a thorn in people that are truly gifted to speak for him side, to keep them in check, to keep them grounded, to keep a gravity on them. And I think Paul was writing this to let people know that, yeah, I may come across as arrogant and bold, but this is really the real motivation behind it, okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Instead, just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please men, but rather God, who examines our hearts. For we never use flattering speech, as you know, or had greedy motives. God is our witness, and we didn't seek glory from people, either from you or from others. So some of the gravity that we have to realize when you have the gift, when God gifts you and he calls you to speak on his behalf, is that it should not to be pleasing men, but to please God. That's, right. That's what Paul writes there. Paul, obviously, he was gifted with gab for God because he was able to get up and speak by the power of the Holy Spirit. But he wanted people to know that he was approved by God and entrusted with the good news. Approved by God and trusted with the good news. This is a good sign that you might have the gift of gab, that you might be gifted by the Holy Spirit to speak on God's behalf. Is A good sign of the gifting is a testing and a trusting by God. Because that's what the word approve there really means something that's been put through the fire. Something that's been tested and tried and reproved and came out approved by God, like a stamp of approval from God after he's tested you and tried you and made sure that your motives were right. And then it says entrusted. God, that means God had faith in the people that he gives, gives the gift of speaking on his behalf. So if you've ever been tested and ever been trusted by God, if you've gone through the testing and God still trusts you with his word to speak over people, to speak into people, then you might be gifted by the Holy Spirit for the gift of speaking on his behalf. Amen? He understood, the thing about Paul, though, is he understood the weight that came with the words he spoke. That's why he says, he makes it clear that it wasn't to please, God, please men, but to please God. It wasn't for his glory or his gain or for his greed or for money. It was for God's glory. Right. Not just pastors, preachers, and teachers, but especially pastors, preachers, and teachers need to realize this. Okay? Not just pastors, preachers, and teachers. Everybody needs to realize this. But especially pastors, preachers, and teachers need to realize this. That it is not for pleasing people. Okay. And I'm going to be completely transparent and honest. There's been times where in this short time that I've been pastor that I've let Satan get to me. And I've been consumed with making sure, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, I mean, Kyle and I had a, a conversation just, was that last week that we talked? Um, and I was really being, I thought I was really being convicted um, because I was like, man, these messages that God has given me that I'm preaching, they just are like convicting and they're just like hitting and they're just constantly rebuking and constantly convicting. I need to, I need to come up with something more encouraging. I need to, I need to have messages that are more encouraging, that are more uh, uplifting to people. 
Um, and I, but I think that's Satan. I think that was Satan trying, now that I look back on it and after praying about it for a while, I think that was Satan saying basically that, because I'm mean, just be honest, people like to hear a good encouraging message, don't they? They like to be uplifted. They like to be encouraged. Paul says that they didn't use flattering speech. So it wasn't for what people wanted to hear. It was all about what God wanted him to say. And so telling on myself, there's been many times that I've started to prepare a message and I fought God and said, man, this is another, like, you're kicking me in the butt. So I know you're going to kick other people in the butt. Why do you keep having me give these messages? But it's because that's what God is speaking. That's, right. that's what God wants people to hear. That's right. So it's not about approving, about pleasing men. It's about pleasing God with what he's given you to say. Mm -hmm. There's a weight to the words that all believers speak, as we all have been entrusted with the good news. Right. There's a weight to what you speak. Yeah. Even if you're not gifted to use that for the church, there is a weight to what you speak. There's a gravity to what you speak. Because we've all been entrusted in some form or fashion with the good news. To your family, to your kids, there's a weight that goes into Speaking that stuff into your kids, speaking that stuff into your family, speaking that into your friends at school. But sometimes he gives you a gift to use that for a bigger purpose and for the church and for maybe ambitions or maybe whatever it is. Like he still gifts, gifts that in bigger ways, but you have to seek him to make sure if that's your calling, if that's your gifting. We all have a story to tell. Right? Mm -hmm. Say amen if you believe you have a story to tell. Amen. If God has changed you, if God has mm -hmm. taken you from a wretched sinner, well, we still may be wretched sinners, but if he's cleaned you up and pointed you in a new direction, you have a story to tell. If God is changing your life, if he's done things in your life, like he has healed Robin of a potential cancer, honestly, a few years ago. She gave that story, what was that thing? Huh? On, a on a Wednesday, yeah. She actually, was that this past Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but we all have stuff that God has worked in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. We all have ways that God has worked in our lives. And we all have a story to tell. And there's a weight to that story that we have to tell. We must not base the words that we speak on the need for human approval. Mm -hmm. It's not about what people say. If God has given you a message, if he's given you a story to tell, if he's given you a word to speak, it's not about what people say. Right. It's about what he thinks. It's about the approval that you get from him. Amen? Amen? When we aim to please men is when we start to displease God. And I'm, like I said, this one kicked me in the butt because it's very easy when you prepare messages and you, you seek God to give you words to speak to people, to speak over people, to start thinking, well, this person needs to hear that. This person needs to hear that. This person would want to hear that. But it's not about that. Right. It's about what God would have you say to people and over people. We have to use that in our own stories to tell. You have a story. You have people that need to hear that story. Tell the story. Yeah. It's your story, but it's his glory. He can use your story, and he will use your story for his glory. Our story is his glory. And that's why Paul writes, if you guys notice that he writes, for we never used flattering speech as you know or had greedy motives. God is our witness, and we didn't speak. We didn't seek glory from people, either you from for others. He made it clear that his story was for God's glory, not for his own glory. It wasn't for money. It wasn't for, and praise God, pastoring and preaching is not for money. <laughs> Amen. It is for his glory and his glory alone. It's not for anybody. It's not for any individual's glory. It's not for any individual's uh, building up. It's all for him. Paul knew that his motives were pure because God was examining his heart. Examine there in that word, in that uh, when he said that God, we speak not to please men, but rather God who examines our hearts. That examines is a present tense verb. 
That means that God was continually purifying Paul's heart. Just like when David wrote in the Psalms, God create a clean heart in me. That it's a daily constant thing that we have to do. We have to let God examine our motives in the way that we live, in the way that we, and especially when we speak. God has to continually, and Paul knew that. Paul knew that his motives were pure because he asked God to examine his heart and continually examine his heart. We please God through purity in what we speak and in purity in how we live. And I'm not, talking, I'm not just talking about um, the pureness like without sin, which we do please God when we speak without sin and we live a life without sin. Amen? Amen. Because that's what we're, when he says walk worthy of the calling, that's what that means is walk worthy, walk daily, constantly trying to live your life better without sin. Because that's what Jesus, that we're trying to aim to be like Jesus, right? Jesus was perfect without sin. Now, we're never going to reach that status until he comes back to get us. But that should be our daily goal. So your daily goal should be asking God to examine your heart, make sure that there's no impure motives, no impure greed, no impure glory that you're seeking to speak to others. And that's what Paul was trying to get across here. That's what he was making sure they knew. We only find that purity in a constant, confidential communication with the only one who can truly examine you. I preached a sermon uh, a few months ago. I can't even remember what it was, but about the a series about the, the uh, radical prayers that you can pray. Do you guys, anybody remember that series? Okay, one of those sermons was a prayer that you can pray called Search Me. And there's a ver there's a I can't even remember I can't even remember which scripture it was but um, I think it was a psalm that David wrote and he says search me O God when you pray search me that's exactly the same thing that Paul was saying where he said Paul, where God examines the heart when you do that you have to be re ready for God to show you what's in your heart. <laughs> And for not only that, but when he shows you what's in your heart, to get your heart right. And when you do that, that's when we can live truly and speak truly with pure motives, without any greed, without any glory for ourselves. Motives are impure when we seek acceptance of men over approval of God. When we seek, when we seek pleasing and we care more about what people think about us than what God would have you say, that's when motives become impure because then you're put too much too much in people and not enough in the savior are you the kind of person this is getting more practical now are you the kind of person that can speak your mind no matter what to no matter who if so then you may have a gifting not saying that all people that can speak their mind no matter what to no matter who are gifted. And not saying that people that can't speak their mind to no matter what to no matter who at any time aren't gifted. But I think God uses boldness. If you're a bold person, God uses boldness for his good. Right? We should all be that way with the good news of Jesus, shouldn't we? I mean, it is good news. Amen. Jesus coming to save our souls, him coming to this earth in the form of a baby in a manger is good news. Right. Because if it wasn't for him, we would be bound for hell. Right. We, would be, we would live this life without any kind of hope for the future. And living a life without hope for the future is living a life of darkness. His, it is good news. We should all be so bold about the good news of Jesus. And just because, the thing about it is, just because it's good news doesn't mean that everybody will take it as good. And that's what Paul's trying to get across here is that he preached the good news of Jesus and he got beat for it. He preached the good news of Jesus and he got shipwrecked. He got persecuted. He got thrown in jail. Just because it's good news, and it is good news, doesn't mean that everybody's going to take it as good, but it doesn't matter how people take it. If God has called you to preach the good news, then you should preach it for him and not for anybody else. 
It's your story, but it's his glory. And we all have a bit of good news to share people, share with people, right? Amen. We all do. Because if he's changed your life, then you have good news. Right. And if you're ready for him to come riding on a cloud and take you home, then we have good news to share with people. Right. Yeah. And God is working. Jesus is working. The Holy Spirit is working in this world. Despite 2020, despite the craziness that has gone on this year, he's still working. I mean, just look back there at those presents back there and what we've been able to do with Lifeline and what he's done in your lives, like money-wise or uh, if your kids have grown spiritually or if others around you have grown spiritually, if you've grown spiritually, there is, God is still working. We still have good news to share. We need to use our story for his glory. That's why Psalm 115.1 says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but your name be the glory. Because of your love and your faithfulness. Your name be the glory. Not my name. Not the name of Life Fellowship. Not your name individually. Not the name of Stephen Furtick. Not the name of Mike Todd. Not the name of any other person that's been gifted with the ability to speak on God's behalf. Your name be the glory, God. Amen. And that's what Paul is trying to say there. It's not Paul's name that gets the glory. We get to study Paul. We get to read about Paul. But it's all... God's glory working through Paul. And that leads us to the last point and where we're going to finish this. There's glory in the gift. There's glory in the gift of Gab. And that glory is not for us. It's all for him. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, continuing the last part of the verses that we've been saying in. If anyone speaks, it should be of the, as the one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, it should be uh, from the strength that God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be long the glory, the power, forever and ever. Amen. The goal, the greatness, the gravity of this gift of Gad all ultimately point to his glory. Yeah, there's a goal to having teachers and preachers and pastors and missionaries and being able to take his word yeah there's a goal for building up the church and training people in righteousness yeah there's a greatness to it you you have to realize that you're speaking god's actual words when he's gifted you to do that there's a gravity to it knowing that you can't get ahead of god and you can't let it be for your glory or to please men you have to be grounded in his word you have to be grounded with him examining your heart but it all is for the ultimate purpose of pointing to his glory that's why he gifts people in this way, is for him to get the glory, him, get the, him to get the honor, him to get the praise. In every word we say, in every song we sing, in every lesson we teach, in every message we preach, in every praise we make, in every action we take, in every story we tell, and remember, you have a story, his glory, we yell. Amen. Let me read that again, because that took me some. That took me a minute to come up with. I was actually going to put a beat to it, but I'm I'm not going to do that. I'm not feeling very. Garrett, maybe maybe Garrett can beatbox for me. In every word we say, in every song we sing, in every lesson we teach, in every message we preach, in every praise we make, in every action we take, in every story we tell, and you have a story. His glory we yell. That's the point of everything. If he's gifted you, use it for his glory. If God has called you, he will equip you. He doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. If he's called you, he will equip you through his glory and for his glory. If God knows that it's about any other purpose but for his glory then he's not going to call you. But if it's for his glory, he will call you and he will equip you. To glorify God is to glorify him through Jesus and in everything. Jesus is the only way that we can glorify God. We don't have the ability to glorify God on our own strength, by our own merit. It's only because of what Jesus did for us on that cross that we even have the, the means, the instrument to glorify God. 
Jesus is the glory of God. It's not us, it's not our lives, it's not our words. It's Jesus is the glory of God. The greatest gift that we can give is the good news of Jesus and glory to the Lord. Amen. The greatest gift we can give is good news to the lost and glory to the Lord. Has God gifted you to gab for him and for his glory? I don't know. That's something you got to get one-on-one -on -one with him and, and seek. And only his spirit can guide you and show you if you've been gifted in that way. Not everybody is gifted, but everybody has a responsibility to share the good news and to share his glory. But some of us are gifted to do it on a bigger scale. You just have to get one-on-one -on -one with him to find out if that's you. And ultimately, you have, to, you have to know Jesus first. We're not going to do an invitation, but I, I want to pray, and I want you to spend a little bit of time one-on-one -on -one with God. We're going to do this next week, too, because next week, um, just going to give you guys a, a hint of what next week is about. It's about serving gifts. This week was about speaking gifts. Next week is about serving gifts. And guess what? Just a little hint. We all have the ability to serve. We all have a responsibility to serve. But God has gifted people to serve in bigger ways than he has others. Just like he's gifted people to speak in bigger ways than he has others. But it, you got you to gotta get one-on-one -on -one with him and find out what your gift is. Hopefully this has brought to light what the gift of speaking means, what the gift of speaking on his behalf means, and the ways you can do that. Um, but you got to get one-on-one -on -one with him and find out for sure. So let me pray. And I want, you, I want us to spend a, a couple quiet minutes just so you can do business with God with no distractions, no music, no nothing, to find out has he gifted you to use your voice for his victory? Lord God, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you still gift people to speak the very words that you would have us speak. Your very word to this lost and dying world. Lord, I pray right now over every heart, every person in here in, here in this building or online watching this or that will watch this at a later time. Lord, I pray for their hearts right now. I pray that they soften their hearts, that they let your Holy Spirit speak to them in a way and find out from you directly, have you gifted us? Do you have a purpose in the voice that we have, the, the platform that we have, the boldness that we have to speak for you? That's the only way we can find out. There's no, there's no spiritual gift test, no spiritual gift uh, barometer that we can take online or anything like that that will tell us if we have the gifting, it's only from you. And it's only through your Holy Spirit that will let us know. Lord, right now in this time of quiet, I just pray that you speak to the hearts right now and that we more than that, that hearts receive what you would have for us. If there's anybody here that needs to come to know Jesus for the very first time, to be able to give that glory, to be able to have that story to share, let today be that day. All we have to do is accept the free gift that you've given by dying for our sins and paying the price for our sins on the cross and coming back and, and not staying in the grave but rising from the dead so that we have the hope and the gift of eternal life. Lord, be now in this time. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise, and it's in Jesus' name we pray.